Hello once again ladies and gentlemen we are live here in the Axminster Skills Centre uh, once again for a routing uh, workshop uh, once again bringing the Skills Centre to your home. Um, now last time, uh, I hope you joined us last time, we looked at freehand routing on the bench, um, we looked at nameplate making, some freehand engraving, looking at a variety of different cutters that really suited this sort of work. So that was kind of an introduction to uh, bench work, just getting to grips with, with the router itself. Um, we are live. <laughs> getting to grips with the router itself. Um, bench work is okay, but a lot of time with the router you need to do certain jobs that are either too small to take to the bench and they're difficult to clamp and grip, or you know, the, the cutters needed to do that job are far too big to be handheld. Now this is probably about as big as router cutters go, the panel raising cutter, and I will cover this in, in later videos as we, as we go week on week every Wednesday at four. Um, but a router table in the home workshop is, is a godsend. I've certainly got one, uh, it's one that I made, and we can look at made router tables as well if you want. Um, but please, as, as last week and as with Colwyn's videos, we encourage questions, so let's interactive. Please ask uh, if you've, you didn't catch something that I've done or said, or you want to see something in particular, please just ask the question. So behind the camera today, we've got my friend and colleague, Anthony. Uh, he a uh, very experienced chap, so he can help you with, uh, with the questions, as I can, so please keep those questions coming in. So as said, we're, we're hitting up on the router table today. Now we've got quite a sizable one here. We do a lot of routing in, in the skill center, and as a company, we've, we've got a lot of routing products. This is a cast iron UJK, quite large, quite heavy router table. And this is the one we're gonna be using today. Um, let me just pick the bits up, and I dropped on the floor earlier. <laughs> there we go. Um, so we've got a, a nameplate that we've done. You might remember this spiral one last week, and I've put a bit of color in there. I've put some, some black paint. Now it's not a wood dye. I tend to, when I'm coloring these letters, not use wood dye. Wood dye is designed to soak in to the material, to the timber. And what happens, you'll, you'll get, it, it'll bleed out of these lines. And you'll get a little, these lines won't be so crisp. They'll be a little bit fuzzy where it bleeds out. So you don't want any material or any paint or any coloring that really uh, dies, it wants to sit on the surface like a paint. Um, once painted, a little dust over with a sander or a planer or a surface planer or thickness if you've got just to take a very light skim to crisp up these edges again and it really does make the, uh, the lettering stand out even more. Um, by all means if you prefer the kind of the natural wood look where you don't want any colour, happy for that, it looks lovely as well. But once we've got the lettering on Quite often, I feel we need to just lose these sharp corners. We need to put, I call it framing. We need to put a frame around this. We need to round over the edge. And there's a, there's a number of cutters that really lend, this, uh, lend themselves to this particular type of work. And that's what we're gonna look at today. It's a, a great first project for the first router on the bench, the lettering, or at the router table, this edge framing. So, without further ado, we will just get stuck into the cutters and some framing with the router table. I think the first cutter we will use is the nice, simple bevel cutter. Now it's a bevel or chamfer cutter. Now with this, the maximum you can get on this particular cutter, say, would be about 20 mil but with a retraction of the cutter, just dropping the cutter down inside the table, you could just do a very subtle chamfer as well. It's quite an easy to control cutter and can be used at the bench as long as it's not too big, but really lends itself to the router table and quite a versatile little cutter. They come in half inch shank for the bigger routers, but also in a similar size head, similar size cutting size, you can get them in quarter inch shank as well. Most, if you buy a box set of cutters with your, with your router, they'll definitely include one of these. Something that's really useful, and I feel that that's the one we're going to start with today. I'll use the half inch shank one. So, we're going to look at the router table. I'm 
The router table is your router flipped upside down. You take the material to the table instead of taking the router to the material. Now, very similar to this sort of setup. So what we've got here is, that would be your table surface. You've got a cutter that protrudes through that table surface. He says, hang on, there we go. There we go. You've got a cutter that protrudes through, and we've got a fence, a straight edge, a guide to run against. Now that's what this is here. This is your straight edge, your fence, as this is the fence. This would be the router top, uh, the router base rather. And because it's flipped upside down, it becomes the kind of tabletop. So that is the kind of router table configuration, but of course this would be more for bench work. So your router table is a router upside down. So I'm going to load in my, my first cutter. Now, this one, I mentioned this last week. The setup that I've got, I always make sure that the power's off. I'm switched off here, totally isolated, before I go diving in for cutters. Now, the setup that I've got on this particular one, that's the plate that I've got in the router table. But I've left the, the fixed base fixed to the table and I can just take the motor unit in and out. So I can use the plunging base at the bench, or the fixed base stays underneath, and just makes it really easy, so one router does all. And it also makes it easy to load cutters in and out. Now, I don't know whether you remember last week, talking about cutter care, didn't talk about that too much, we'll do that in subsequent videos, sharpening even, we can look at that. We will look at colic care as well, and it really is, just keep it clean. Good extraction is really important. That always keeps it very clean, but a little brush, a blowout, just keep this collet in good condition. Keeping it clean is important. Now what I like to do, just to make it easier for me to change the cutters, because this is round, and when I'm trying to undo the nut, it rolls all over the place. So this one drops into this router base nicely, and then Got something a little bit more substantial. Span us the hand. Okay. I'm just going to load this cutter in. Remember the K-line, that's a dear to the K-line. If the K-line is not there, maybe worn away, you've got an oldish cutter. Three quarters of the way along the shank. And then that cutter is locked in nicely. We don't want to give it too much. Remember the, the two grunts out of five. I don't know whether you joined us last week and saw that. So on a five grunt scale, five being white knuckle, tight as I can get it. This is just a two grunt. You don't need to go that tight. Okay, that one drops to one side. And before I put that in, it's important when we're dealing with routers and router tables that we close down the aperture, the hole in this area, the hole in the table and the hole in the fence as much as we can. Because what we don't want to do, I mean, I'm going to be putting a moulding around this really small piece of material. And we don't want a wide gap here to potentially drop in. We've got to close that down as much as possible. Now with a plate, a template on the router table like this, you've got the option to change the table inserts to different sizes. And you want to get that as close as you can to the cutter diameter. Clearly that one's not going to go through, but the one I had on there was, was kind of the perfect size. That drops in there nicely. Okay. Yeah. Then I can load this back into the machine really quickly, really easily. Now you might have just seen that just pop through the tabletop here now. Now what I can do, this is what this is going to help me control how much material I remove. Um, I'm going to put a little chamfer on our little spiral board. Okay. Now if I raise that cutter up, we get more and more blade exposed. Therefore, removing more material and taking a, getting a, a wider, bigger chamfer cut. So I'm going to take a little cut to start with, and we're going to set that up. If you're working to a particular height, now you might be doing a rebate. Um, 
A rebate is just like a corner removed. Right? And this is a piece that is most definitely for router table work. Um, this is a threshold that I made, uh, I think I alluded to it last week. Um, I fitted a floor, I had um, some thresholds to make. I didn't like the, the, the factory ones, the ones I could buy, so I made my own oak ones. So we've got a little subtle round over there that was created with a much larger cutter. Now I didn't use the full moulding, the full shape, and you don't have to. You can just use a little piece of that cutter to do the job you want to do. There we go, we can see that. Well, that's picked up that shape. Also, we've got a rebate there. Now the rebates generally are a specific dimension. It might be 10 mil up, 10 mil in. And something that's quite useful to help you create that rebate is a little height gauge of some description. Just something like that. So you can really gauge the height of the cutter as you raise it. Little indicator there. You can use a rule, you can do a few test cuts, whatever suits, but you've always got a way to, um, to, to f try and find a way to, to finally adjust the cutter height. This one underneath, uh, something that you've really got to consider if you're putting a router underneath the table, is that cutter projection. The amount of the cutter sticks through the top of the table is everything really. You really need to get that right. Um, and a stiff plunge or, or maybe a router that doesn't have that fine adjustment, it's difficult to get the, uh, the cutter projection. A lot of machines do have, I don't know whether you can get close enough, you probably won't see that, but I've got a little fine adjuster under there. And I'm just raising and lowering that cutter subtly, half millimeter at a time. And like I say, I'm just gonna take the lightest skims just to give it a very subtle chamfer up right now. Once I'm happy with the height, I'll lock that off. Right, a really good view to see what you're gonna remove. It's difficult to, to eye it, it's difficult to visualize what's gonna happen. If you offer them material up, right, and this is a bearing guided cutter, which we're not really using the bearing at this point. Oh, do we have a question? We've got a question. Oh, let's have a question. Okay, so Bill's asked us, uh, you mentioned the K-line several times last week yep. and today. Yes. Is it called the K-line because the arrow under the depth line resembles the letter K? Yes, it is. When viewed on its side? Yes. Uh, old bits don't have these markings, yeah. so should I always use the last three quarters of the shaft yeah. depth if there are markings not present? Bill, you've got it. Yeah, K-line because it looks like a K. And it really is the line with a little arrow pointing to that line, which kind of looks like the letter K. And you're absolutely right in saying that um, three quarters of the length of the shank. That's a good, safe amount. You don't want to pull that cutter out too much and risk it coming out. You don't want to ram it all the way into the collet and risk getting it stuck. So, top work, yes. Three quarters of the way along the shank. So, I said we've got a bearing guided cutter. Bearing guided is, is generally for following shapes, following curvy shapes, and we'll do that afterwards. I've got some curves, I'll cut a curve for you and do some, some curve edge moulding, that'll be pretty cool. But a really good view to see how much material you're removing is if you offer the cutter up, have a look down this line. You can't see it, but I can. All right, and you can just see that cut line there, how much the material is going to remove. If you've got a big batch to do, or some really expensive piece of material that you only get one hit at, it's worth just doing a few task cuts on something that is not that important. I'm happy with cutter height, but of course now I've got to set the fence. If I was going to be plunging that into there, it's not really going to work for us. Feet direction is critical. Cutter is rotating this way. You can see which way the blades are facing. It rotates this way, okay, counterclockwise. You feed against the rotation. Gives you the control. If you were to feed with the rotation, for instance, that cutter is, like I say, counterclockwise, and you're feeding that direction, even with the, the if it's not a particularly powerful router, it'll take the material out of your hand, fire it across the workshop. I've seen it done. It's not good. It's not good. Um, so, against the rotation. We're going to set the fence. 
Now the fence is a really important part of your router table. Whether it's a factory made router table like this or, or something you made yourself, it's got to be solid, it's got to be adjustable, it's really got to have an aperture here for, for the cutter to come through and it's lovely if we get some sort of extraction on there. It makes a big difference when we've got extraction. It really, really, really does. So, this fence is adjustable. As said, we want to close down a lot of factory bolt router tables. You can move the fences in the lane, and it's great. You can really close down that aperture there. All right, oh, we've just really narrowed that gap there. Narrowed the, the exposure to the cutter, in effect. It's, it's good. Um, a lot of something that a lot of people do is they, they struggle to align these two fences. What we don't want to do is be feeding our material through and we'll get corner to corner clash because the fence, this, these two separate fences aren't quite aligned. A lot of people, it's a quite, a, quite a safe way to work, they'll do it on spindle molders like giant router tables, is adding a false fence. You can see it's just a straight piece of. 8mm MDF I think it is, with an aperture cut, that will drop onto there. You would get a couple clamps, say, something like that, and that has really closed down that, that area now. It gives me a very smooth, straight surface to run my material against. You might have a couple of different ones of these kicking around the workshop. You can, like I say, clamp these on as long as the clamps don't get in the way of your um, feeding the material through. Uh, these generally fence plates are made from, from wood, from MDF, and you can screw or bolt these directly to the fence if you want. I tend not to do that because I'm, I'm happy with my setup. I know that my fences are in line and what I do also, just to be sure, I'll take a little file and just ease the leading edge on this. So just put a little, uh, remove the corner in effect, so that doesn't make contact. So I don't get stuck and I'm not forced to force it through. Which is never good. Okay, I'm going to close down the aperture. There we go. And I don't want to make contact with the cutter, so I'm not bringing it in too close. There we go, and we'll just quickly pinch those up. Yeah, and at this point, I'm going to lock one end of the fence. Now, I'm not worried whether that fence is dead straight. That's not important. The fence, really, you know, could be skewed like that. It could be skewed like that. Because we're working in the middle, and it's one central pivot point almost, you will always get the same cut results. You really only need the fence to be straight and parallel on the table if you're working in the mitre fence slot. You're doing a particular job, you've got a jig you've made, you've got a mitre fence, you've got one of these um, coping sleds, um, then you're working off the fence as a reference then, so everything needs to, be, needs to be straight and parallel. But for this job, it doesn't matter, so you can really eye it just there. Right? Now something else that could control how much material you're removing is the position of your fence. You see, more cutter exposed, less cutter exposed. I'm going to control, as I said, on this particular bevel, control the amount of material removed by raising and lowering the cutter. I don't want to really come into contact with the bearing, so I'm just going to flush off the bearing to the fence. Easy way to do that. Get a steel rule. And we want to just kiss the bearing. That's, yeah, that's not making contact with that bearing. There we go. All right, so what we've got now is a very little, little skim almost. And it's good actually, just to, if you've not got a test piece, just do a very light cut first, make sure your positioning, positioning is, is all right, and then you can work your way in. Sometimes on some cuts, you need to do that anyway. A big cutter like this panel razor, I wouldn't try and rip all of this out in one hit. I'll work my way into the material step by step. More forgiving on your router and you actually, because it's extremely noisy. And we all know routers are noisy. So when we're cutting, when we're doing this, 
Ear defenders are a must, and most definitely eyewear. Um, good extraction is important too, because fast running machines, and they're throwing the waste around the workshop if you're not careful. But um, we've got some good extraction on this one, and I'm confident there's not going to be too much mess. Therefore, I'm not going to wear a dust mask because I need to talk to you guys. I'm kind of happy with that so far. Everything's locked off, everything's solid. I've got the cutter height I want. Uh, I think I'd like a little bit of guarding. This is still a little bit open, a little bit exposed. I don't want something to give me a hand pushing down. I don't want to have to put my hands real close to that to make sure that I'm pushing, getting downward pressure towards the cut. Because some cutters you do get a little bit of lift, particularly if it's a small lightweight piece of material, the cutter cutting action may lift that. Introduction of a feather board. Now these are very simple things. All right. You've got fingers that bend and flex and put downward pressure as you're feeding the material through. They run in a slot on the top of the fence. You can also get them that, that run in the table slot as well and put uh, pressure down uh, across to the to the fence. This one's pushing down towards the table. It's just going to give me give me a hand to make sure I get I get better results actually because there's no there's no potential lift, no potential movement of material. Sliding in, I'll just drop that, this is kind of in the middle of the cup by the way, and I'll drop that on and put very light pressure downwards, just lightly, okay, and then feed that through, and I just need a little bit more down this end, now that's giving me the control I need right by the cutting area. So I don't have to push too close. All right, so good. Cutter height set. We've got the cutter shape that we want. Um, what about cutter speed? Okay, well, it's a, it's a, not a massive cutter, but like something like this, it needs to run probably the slowest your router will run. But it's not a teeny little cutter like this. It's somewhere in between. Now, as said, on the shankier cutter, it gives you the, the kind of maximum running speed. If you're unsure, well, what can you do? Always start slow. Wind it right down to the slowest speed on the router and just build that speed up gradually. I think the router will tell you when it gets uh, when, when movement starts. You get a little bit of vibration, you get a noise change, you get a tone change. Not whilst cutting, but you just build that speed up gradually. If it's a medium size cutter, then generally on the speed dial on your machine, it's kind of the medium setting. These these speed dials on machines, they kind of go from 1 to 5 or 1 to 6. They don't go 10,000 RPM, 12,000 RPM, 18,000 RPM. So it's kind of get to know your router a little bit. Um, I know that the fastest this machine goes is 20,000. The slowest is 10,000. Halfway through my scale is about 15,000. Right, so just get to know your router a little bit. There's a particular sequence as well. I'm going to put this through. All right, because I want to... I want it to be a really good finish. I'm going to go end, side, end, side. I'll show you why. I'll do an end first and then we'll have a look at the results. Bear in mind we're taking a very light cut at the moment. So, it's going to get a little bit noisy. I'm going to uh, turn the machine on, turn the extraction on as well. Build the speed of the cutter up gently and then do my first cut. Pretty painless, it was alright. So, am I about there and can you see? see am I up, am I down, or am I in the middle? You're around about in the middle. Right, yeah. lovely. So you can see that we've just removed a very subtle bevel, a little chamfer there. It's not too bad, but quite often when you're coming through the end grain, you get breakout on the end. Now I wouldn't want that on my finished piece. 
So we do end, and then we do this side, and then that removes this breakout. Let me show you. Actually, I'm going to take a little bit more material off. You can see that's a, a very subtle chamfer. There's not a lot of material removed, and I just want a little bit more. So I'm going to raise that bevel cutter up ever so slowly. So I'm isolated. I'm just going to unlock and lift. This is a beauty of fine adjustment. There we go. Okay, and we go again. So compared to last time, we've removed more material, so it's, it's looking a little bit more attractive. We've got that breakout, and like I said, you wouldn't want that on your final piece, because after routing, often difficult to sand. You know, some of those um, some of those intricate shapes are very difficult to sand, so you almost want them straight off the router, ready to go, ready to put your oil or your, your wood dye on, or whatever you want to do. So end side. I'm going to go all the way around this, so I've got three more faces to go. Okay, look how crisp and clean these corners are. All right, a little subtle bevel all the way around, all equal, all framing and making, I know it's a, it's a very simple shape and not anything particularly significant, like a kid's door frame or a door, door sign or anything like that. But just putting that bevel softens that edge and just makes it look a little bit better. But like I say, what is really nice is how crisp and clean those corners are. End side, end side, always. Now this was a fairly easy piece of material to, to machine, to be honest, because it's fairly sizable. I didn't have any issues, although machining end grain is a little bit more difficult no matter what machine you, you're trying to use. Um, there's more resistance, uh, there's a risk of more burning, and we'll talk about burning as we're going on, because oh, I know it's quite significant with, uh, with routers and routing, um, but it was, it was a fair sized piece of material and when I was doing the end I felt that I had enough surface contact material to fence. On a smaller piece of material there is a real risk that there's, as you're feeding through that there's a tipping there. Even with a false fence or a closed aperture there's still a risk of, of tipping into that hole. So you know you can, you can use a mitre fence you can use a oh we got a we got a question comment on uh, that piece that you just passed through from uh, Gerald. Uh, I was surprised that you didn't do the end grain first. I did. End side, end side, end, end side, end side. So we are now looking at a slightly smaller piece of material. As said, this was quite a wide surface contact, so I wasn't worrying about this tipping too much. But sometimes, some jobs you do, there's a little raised panel door, and we'll cover this as we go on through weeks. We'll build your routing knowledge up so you're able to do this by the end of it. You know, the intricate profile that's on the end of this, okay, and it's such a small piece. We need to kind of grip that because that's going to tip and wobble all over the place. Sometimes, just a little pushing device like this will help. Help support the material. Something like this is really quite good, and I use this a lot. When I when you do the panels on this particular little mini door, okay, so we're using the biggest cutter available, the raised panel cutter, but it's getting fairly narrow here, and that raised panel cutter coming through, there's a lot of resistance there. And there's a risk that this material is going to tip against the fence. Look at that, that's a lot of stuff to come out. We work our way into that in three or four cuts, to be honest. This is where something like this comes in really handy. 
Like so, we've got a little kind of that, that finger there stop, helps stop lift. So it kind of mirrors the job that this is doing. But what it does more importantly, that's against the fence, that's also against the fence. So what we've got is a really long surface contact area and a lot of support for our material, helping to prevent that, that twist and tipping that you sometimes get when using end grade. Very th simple thing to knock up. It's a couple of pieces apply and I think it's an old saw handle there. Um, but, uh, you know, and little jigs, we've got lots of different little jigs here that we can, we can look at through the weeks. Um, so, let's look at actually machining a smaller piece of material. There's risks involved. We talked about tipping, but physically we're a lot closer to the material. So we'll look at that as we, as we go on. But that's the first one, the little, the little chamfer, the little bevel cut. Another question. Okay, fire away. So Dave is asking, uh, when you are doing the end grain, would it be prudent to reduce the feed speed compared to the long grain? No, I don't. No, no, I, know, I know logic, well for me, from my experience, I know logic says slow down. But I think a feed speed, a consistent feed speed is better. You really do pick up a lot of burning on the end grain. On, on a massive cut, if you're taking a massive cut, but not your final cut, then yeah, maybe slow down and help the waste clear, but you will pick up a lot of burning on that end grain on, on most materials, I feel. Um, I do find if I've got a, a little burn mark I want to remove, then a little light whiz across quickly removes that burn mark. So I kind of, you, you figure out your feed speed on, on, on the material you're using. You will notice if you go too slow, it will, it will literally go black. And that's where that cutter's just lingering in that area for too long. Happens on the side grain and on the end grain. Pop that up there out of the way, I'm going to check. Right. Isolated. I think the cutter I'll use now is we'll call it a rounding over cutter. Very common again if you buy a box set of cutters, 12 cutters, you definitely get one or maybe two of these cutters within that set. Probably the, the, the style of cutter with the most sizes available. This is a fairly small one. They do come really quite large, the rounding over. Um, I am still here. I'm just going to get you a big one. Here we go. All right. So that is the same shape. Much larger, obviously, because we're on a half inch shank. But this little fella is really useful. It gets a lot of to be able to ease that edge a little bit um, and put a little bit of detail in as well because it does more than just that round over shape this because if you push it further into the material and we'll have a look at that as we go we can introduce this corner and give another little quirk a little bit of detail on the bigger ones they come with a couple of different bearing sizes so we can actually introduce this corner you can see we've reduced the bearing size here which has exposed this corner and we get a round over and then we could even drop it in a bit further and work in this corner as well. So a useful cutter and I think it's wise to have a few, I know I've got three or four different sizes, um, that is a really common size. So if I'm making a small piece of furniture, uh, here we go. We have had a little drop out here. Hmm? Well we're back live now, we did drop out briefly. Oh okay, well. great. Well, we're back, we're back I believe. We but weren't but now we're here. Um, so if we're rounding over, a small little footstool like this just eases all these edges and consistently. I know we could sand it away, but you wouldn't get any consistency. It wouldn't be as clean. No, it's a really, really common cutter. So I'm not going to use the big boy. Let's use the little one. And it generally is a quick change on this one. We need to say hi to our friends in Australia that are watching as well. Oh, good day! Love it. What's the weather like out there? So, again, I'm not going to go crazy tight. There we go. I've just switched the collets as well because I'm quarter inch now. Even though it's a half inch round, that comes out of the way. The motor unit goes back in. There we go. Okay, um, 
how much cutter do I want to see? Well, it all depends on whether you, because we're going to go for a full round, we're going to be using all of the, the round on the cutter. I'm going to be using all of this. But do I want to see this? I think I'll do one without and then one with, so you get a view on that actual kind of shape difference. Okay, there we go. I'm happy with the aperture. We've closed all that down. It's not a radically different uh, shape cutter. But as the round comes to meet the tabletop surface, I'm just looking, as the rule comes in, I can wind that up just to give me a, a good sight line. There we go. Nice. Because I don't want to see that corner just yet. We'll bring that up. Again, we can just use the rule to align our fence. So we're getting the full round, but not quite kissing the bearing. Look at that, lovely. Right, well I'm just tinkering with this. Next week is it going to be an exciting one. It's just a Q&A session. So no matter what you've got going on with your workshop, you've got, you know, some bandsaw use, um, you want to talk different cutters. You've got this specific cutter that you're not quite sure about, we can look at that. Let's just have a, a good Q&A session for the for the week. Um, we'll be back to regular projects after that. We've got a many, many weeks planned in for you guys of various different stuff, all eventually getting to really making the, the profile and scribe raised panel style door. So from very basic work, bench work, through the next uh, series of weeks to, to really kind of almost high level routing. Okay, let's have a look. This viewpoint, remember, is down this line. I like that. That is very good. Yep, that's going to give me the shape that I want. I'm going to reintroduce this. I know it's a small piece, but it's even more important to use this because it's very lightweight and there's potential for lift. I'm not going to give a great deal of pressure with, it, with this, but it is going to help me out because it's a small piece and I don't fancy putting my hands too close to, too close to the cup. Very light pressure downwards. And too much resistance. Right. End side, end side. It's standard. Never changes. All right. End grain, side grain. Now, I'm going to put that through like that. I could, safety wise, I could probably work on these corners, but why not just use something like this, which keeps you way away from the cutting area. You could use something like this, something you make yourself. It's just got a little bird's mouth on it, a couple of a uh, couple of little handles, so you really don't have to get anywhere near that cut. Or this is really cool, very inexpensive, and really does keep you well away. And that's my chosen, my weapon of choice for this particular task. So there we go. I've got a new cutter in, so I back that speed right off, just in case. We go down to zero. Eyes and ears on. Here's my ears. Just a very subtle round over, okay? Really common cutter, and it just kind of frames that up straight away. We've got a little bit of dirt off the table there. I was machining some hardwood this morning, and it's just picked up a little bit of hardwood dust. Um, but it just eases those edges and just makes it look more attractive. We can add in just a little bit more detail there. I'm going to raise that cutter up so we get to see. We get we introduce this this little corner, this little quirk as it's known sometimes. It's just a case of raising that cutter up. I'm going to do it by eye, so I'll get down, look at the viewpoint. That's nice. So, before, 
just a, a nice easy plain mould. Round over. I've only done the two sides, I oh, know, I didn't forget, it was just to, uh, to to show you guys a little comparison. And there we go, we've introduced that corner there now, just to give us a little bit more detail. So we've gone from the round to the little quirk there, just with raising the cutter. Okay, So that's almost Finn's room's nem nameplate sign done. Alright, that's all straight stuff, that's all nice and simple. I think we should look at doing some similar sort of edge moulding on, on some curvy stuff. Now, here's one I prepared earlier, like in true Blue Peter fashion. This is a job I've got to do for one of my colleagues, a new sign for his house. A uh, piece of oak, so not the easiest to machine. Cut an oval on the bandsaw, sanded smooth. It's important if you're doing um, any curve work and you're, you're the bearing guided cutters, and this is where we're going to use a bearing guided cutter, has to follow your cut edge, has to follow your work. So if that edge is rough, then this moulding, this edge is, is going to end up rough. So it's important that you, you make sure it's smooth. All right. uh, and, and oval work, well, we're not going to be using a straight fence, because that's the straight stuff, funnily enough. I'm going to cut a shape for you on our little bandsaw, and then I'm going to take it straight over to the router table, and we're going to Change cutters again, I'm afraid. Quick one. Um, and then we're going to put a, a little bit of detail on that, on that curvy shape. So, Ant, if you can follow me around to the bandsaw. Take my ears off. These bandsaws are really quite quiet. It's nice. Okay. So, I've got a piece of material here. It's about an inch thick, 25 mil. Um, I'm just going to cut a random curve shape here. Nothing particular. All right. I'll turn my extraction on. smooth surface actually there's a few little cut lines and there's an entry and exit line there and that will probably that will show up on my molding but we're gonna we're gonna look at cutting uh, do, doing the molding but on a curve so another cutter change and I think we'll go with something with just a little bit more detail so you've almost got this double quadrant on this one it's a really attractive cutter and again one that I use a lot for, for something that just needs a little bit more a little bit more detail on it How are we doing for time? Oh, we're good. I won't say to perfection, but we're doing all right. So my fence comes off out of the way. I don't need the fence. I don't need anything straight. I'm going to pop that in there. I am going to need some assistance. And I'll talk your way through it as you go. I think first and foremost, it gives me some guarding. This isn't something that we sell, it's something that I made. I made, made a wooden one years ago and I happened upon some uh, phenolic kind of plastic material, so I made a slightly better one. But this really is three functions. All right. Extraction, guarding, and a starting point. 
back that off because I need to change the cut off first over. Alright, so let's make sure we're isolated, cut a, cut a change. So we're going with that. A little bit more detail now on the cutter. Double beat, two round overs in one. And if you've got that cutter actually, you don't need to use both in one go. You could use one or the other. So a lot of these router cutters with a number of different shapes or quite a fancy complicated shape, you can use an, a part of that cutter, which is good. And this is the point, I'm down here now, I'll look at how much of that cutter I want to use. I'm going to use both of the rounds and maybe introduce just that little quirk. You know the second cut I did on the last piece, just to introduce a corner to give me a little bit more detail. I'm going to introduce that on this one as well. New cutter in, speed goes down. Put my little uh, extraction garden guide in place. Here we go. Try and find the end of my pipe. There it is. Okay, looks a bit strange. We've not got a straight edge. What we're doing now is very much uh, relying on the bearing. The bearing follows the shape. Okay, we've got a little starting point there. Now, if you buy a router table or a router table plate, often they come with a pin which fits into the router table. That would be your start point, so your material comes up against, you pivot into it and then you come off this point and let the bearing do the work. I'll show you. Just make sure there's no big waste shavings are going to get caught as I'm trying to feed around. Right, so what we're looking to do if that's our start point, we pivot into the cut, then we come off here and then roll round. Keeping our hands, we're not going to be rolling round here. We can easily control this from back here. We're rolling round if you're really worried. I know a lot of guys that do this. It's fine. We've got a, still a fairly sizable piece and I can control it from, from back here. Cut our speed right down. We've got that double bead. We've introduced this little corner. It's not a very big corner. I think once I've sanded this off, just to get rid of these little bits of fluff on the end, that might disappear. So if that's the case, we can just lift the cutter a little bit more and take a bit more material off to give us a bit more of a corner there. What else have we got? So it's nice and smooth. You see what I mean about making sure whatever you've cut is smooth because that will be replicated in the molding that you do there you go and you see the burning on the end i slowed down i slowed right down on that end to purposely create a bit of burning actually there we go and we can we can remove that burning right, let me just show you Absolutely all of it, but the majority of the burning's gone. 
happens a lot on end grain if you go too slow but you can without you see you think I'd removed all that material but I went back to it and it still sounded like it took a cut what happens when you're machining end grain is it cuts through the fibers to give you your shape but it also flattens down some fibers as well and those fibers kind of instantly lift back up a, a tiny bit a microscopic amount so you can remachine and just take a little skim off remove those fibers that have lifted and that helps remove some of the burning so there we go that is cutting curves cutting straight and now I said this is very much an introduction to your to your router table I know we've got a big super flash and I'm blessed because I've got all the machinery and all the equipment I could really wish for here but you haven't got to go mad on, on spending on, on router tables um, we've got a, quite a, a nice little setup here we've hung underneath a quarter inch Bosch hasn't got to be half inch it's got to be half inch if you start thinking about big stuff like this but uh, this one it's great the home workshop folds down out of the way locks in position Good tabletop size, terrific little thing. Also, I know a lot of guys, and certainly at home, I've made my own router table. Now, if, and there's a possibility just to pan around to the table a smidge. There we go. Let me see here. Right, well, what we've got is a piece of kitchen worktop. This is literally a piece of 40mm kitchen worktop. And we've used some, some track and some, uh, some more track here and an insert plate to hold our router. Now, the insert plate is critical. So that's what the router is, 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 is fixed to. Um, and this is something you can do with your home workshop. Certainly at home, the router table isn't my primary machine, isn't something I use all the time. And like a lot of home workshops, you, you're limited to, router, uh, to, to, to workshop space. So I made mine, uh, similar to this, I made mine so it folds down out of the way. It's a great little thing. Recess underneath. Okay, let's pop this insert out so you can have a little look because I know a lot of guys and girls are keen on this um, this router table homemade thing, making it to your own shape and style. And we've got this some cracking kit you can use to make that router table just a little bit better. Drops in there, you can see the recess is all routed drops in nicely. Important that it's level. That's stuck up a little bit and you're feeding your router cut router your material in. It gets stuck on the corner of the plate. Not good. A bit difficult. Okay. So homemade router tables are great. You can make them to the shape and size. I think an insert plate, a good insert plate with changeable uh, table inserts is important. Um, I think also, you know, you make it to your own shape and style. Make it folding down if you want. Um, guys and girls, that is about all we've got time for today. Please join us next week for the Q&A session. Have a little think. Hit the workshop. Oh, I've had this cutter for a while. I'm not quite sure what it is, what it does. Let's have a look at it. Um, also, don't forget, Colwyn is still turning on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we're Wednesday day, so he's got another session uh, due tomorrow. So join Colwyn for, uh, for another wood turning wizardry. Um, it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. Thanks very much. I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye now.